Ah, yes, please be seated. Let me echo Jones' welcome to you if you're here for the first time. And don't forget, we also have Inspire bookmarks around the place. So if you haven't picked one of these up, make sure you do. Take one, one for a friend as well. There's plenty out there. Uh, we're missing Pastor Brian this morning. Brian's down in Sydney. And I'll be down in Barrel in two weeks' time teaching the students down at the Bible school down there. But don't miss out. In two weeks' time, we'll be having Carly Oldham share Carly, our dear friend Carly, who has been through so much, and she'll be speaking on God's power in our weakness. So you won't want to miss that in two weeks' time. Come and hear Carly, that's for sure. So we're working our way through some selected chapters of Isaiah, and we come to Isaiah chapter 8, chapter 8, verse 19. It'll be up there on the screen for you. Chapter 8, 19. Now, if people say to you, consult the ghosts and the familiar spirits that chirp and mutter, should not a people consult their gods, the dead, on behalf of the living, for teaching and for instruction? Surely those who speak like this will have no dawn. They will pass through the land, greatly distressed and hungry. When they are hungry, they will be enraged and will curse their king and their gods. They will turn their faces upward, or they will look to the earth, but will see only distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. But there will be no gloom for those who are in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the latter time, he will make glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. I'm sure you know this verse. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. And I'm sure you know this verse. For a child has been born for us, a son is given to us, authority rests upon his shoulders. And he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually. And there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Have you noticed some of the amazing sunsets that we've been having recently? I've looked out of my window sometimes. I was thinking, oh, if only I was in a different place with my camera, that would have been so good to capture. Sunset reminds us, doesn't it, that darkness is soon to come. And you realise, particularly during the winter season, that when you see a sunset, it's what, only a half an hour, 45 minutes or an hour later, it will be darkness and that will be it. We live with darkness all of our days. Perhaps you might remember the story of those young boys, 12 boys in the cave in Thailand, for 17 days, there's a movie or documentary, a movie I think it is, coming out next month about the story. I can't imagine living for that long, those many days, 17 days in a dark, wet cave. Probably the last thing you'd ever want to be in. Imagine living in darkness. The opportunity six years ago to, a place, to go to a place called Barentsburg, now, Barentsburg, there's some photos that I took. Barentsburg is only 1,000 kilometres from the North Pole. And I imagine that they paint all their buildings so brightly coloured because it's a fairly drab landscape. It's a population of 455 people and they're made up of Russians and Ukrainians. Even though it's north of Norway, it's actually part of Russia. It's a coal mining town. And the town relies on Russia for its food and for its coinage. But here's the thing. We think we're cold. Imagine this. For only four months of the year, does the temperature get above freezing point? 
the temperature has never exceeded 10 degrees. Wow. Wow. It's not cold today, that's for sure. Snow falls in every month of the year and then from mid-November through to late January, the town is in complete darkness 24-7. The sun being at least six degrees below the horizon. Can you just imagine living in darkness for two and a half months? I mean, I was there during summertime, so it was the opposite. The sun never went down over the horizon. So we had 24 hours of sun for about 10 days. The Russian government, of course, wanting to help the people build a sports hall, I think it's the building on the left there, if I can remember, the blue and white one and the red and white one, a sports hall so that during the middle of winter, people at least could go to these halls and they could do, get some exercise. What would it be like to live in darkness for two and a half months? And then here's a picture of the Russian Orthodox Church. Sadly, a really small church. Obviously, not too many people go to church. I don't, I don't know what it would take, maybe 12 or 20 people, and that's about it. And so this is Baronsburg, north of Russia. Well, we come to Isaiah chapter 8. And we have the threat of Assyria is going to come down, the superpower is going to come down, is going to invade Israel. And Israel and Syria, knowing about this, have formed an alliance together and they've called out to King Ahaz from Judah and said, come and join with us. And King Ahaz has said, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to form an alliance with Assyria, those who are about to invade the land. And so in chapter 8 here, the Lord speaks to Isaiah to speak to the people. In chapter 8, verse 19, he gives a warning. A time of trouble is soon going to come to the people of Judah. And there's a warning here not to get involved with the occult in any way, not to visit diviners, and not to speak to the dead. Now, they should have known this, right? God had already said through Moses on three occasions that the Israelites were not to engage in any of these practices. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 31, do not turn to mediums or wizards. Leviticus 20, verse 6, if any turn to mediums and wizards, prostituting themselves to them, I will set my face against them and cut them off from my people. Deuteronomy 18, no one shall be found among you who consults ghosts or spirits or who seeks oracles from the dead. Isaiah says that being involved with these practices, especially the prophetic utterances that come from the occult, is like the chirping and murmuring in unclear ecstatic sounds. And the warning to the people is this, don't go seeking the dead, Instead, seek after God. His word is reliable and is the source of all authority. The word of God is to be your revelation, not the voice of the dead. And God's will is revealed in his law and through the testimony of the prophets. For Isaiah is saying to the people, soon there will be no light among you. You will live in darkness. No matter how much ecstasy is involved, if what you claim is not aligned with God's will, darkness will envelop you. Isaiah goes on. It's not an encouraging word, is it? Verse 21 and 22, he says this. Darkness is about to descend over the land. And this is a result of God's judgment. War is on the horizon. Terrible things are about to occur. The land is going to be devastated. People will grieve and go hungry. Yet instead of turning from your wicked ways and turning to God, you will actually curse God. Curse God for bringing judgment upon you and you'll curse the king for bringing on the judgment. Isaiah says, you people of Judah, you'll look up for some kind of help, but you won't find it. You'll look down on the ground, but living life will get worse. You'll go from distress to darkness 
to total darkness to living in thick darkness. Now, darkness in the scriptures involves not only the darkness that we know, but also spiritual darkness, economic darkness, social darkness. Yet in their darkest time, Assyria from the north, having brought great devastation upon them, here is the hope in chapter 9, light is about to dawn. Wow. There is a great light that's coming that will spread among the people and with it will come great joy. In fact, Isaiah writes in a tense as if it's already happened. He's so positive, he's so confident. This is what's going to be that he writes it in the present tense. It is occurring right now. And then in verse 1, and I hope you find this as interesting as I do, in verse 1 of chapter 9, he lists a number of places. Now, we can easily dismiss those. I only just pass over them. Zebulon, Naphtali, the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, the Galilee of the nations. These particular areas, the light is going to shine. But as I was doing some research on that this week, each one of those is significant in relation to Jesus. Five areas in Galilee, Isaiah mentions two of them, Zebulun and Naphtali. Both were significant in the childhood and the ministry of Jesus. Remember Nazareth. Well, Nazareth was located in Zebulun. After Joseph and Mary had returned with Jesus, remember they had to escape down to Egypt because King Herod had decided that every boy under the age of two was to be killed in Bethlehem. And so Joseph and Mary escaped with Jesus down to Egypt and then when they come back, they settle in Nazareth, Nazareth of Zebulun. Jesus, in fact, was known as Jesus of Nazareth. This would be the hometown for Jesus as he grew up through his teenage years. It was in Nazareth that Jesus preached in the synagogue. It was in Nazareth that Jesus was rejected by his own townspeople. It had a population, they say, in Jesus' time of about 400 people. Then when Jesus began his ministry, he moved from Nazareth to Capernaum. Where's Capernaum? In Naphtali in Naphtali. Capernaum was a fishing village located on the northern sea, northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, population about 1,500. Jesus taught in the synagogue in Capernaum, healed a man who was possessed. At Capernaum, Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law who was sick with a fever. It's where the men lowered their paralytic friend down through the roof of the house that Jesus was living in. And Jesus cursed Capernaum because of their lack of faith in him. So we've done Zebulun, we've done Naphtali. What about the way of the sea? The way of the sea is the area on the western shores of the Sea of Galilee. And there again, Jesus had much ministry. It's where he called his first disciples to come and follow him. It's where the disciples hopped into the boat to go across the Sea of Galilee while Jesus went up the mountain to pray. The fourth region beyond the Jordan. This is the area of Perea. Again, a place where Jesus would have extensive ministry. It was in Perea that a rich man asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus' final journey to Jerusalem included much of his final weeks spent in Perea. And then the fifth region that Isaiah mentions upon which light will shine is Galilee of the nations. This is the most northern part of Israel where there was a mixed population of Jew and Gentile. The first area to be conquered by Assyria and would remain under, there, under them for the longest time. Here's a verse we just pass over. Five regions. 
And yet these are the areas where Jesus had the most significant ministry because he is the light. The light. Where he would grow up, Nazareth. Where he would base his ministry during his ministry years, Capernaum. Where he would have extensive ministry, all predominantly in that northern region of Galilee. And Isaiah says to the people, Assyria is going to come. The darkness is going to come across your land. But it won't be like this forever, for light is coming. Wonderful. In fact, those areas were so devastated by the Assyrians that for centuries people thought of them as having no worth at all. Remember, Nathaniel asks Philip, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Imagine being known for that. Can anything good come out of that place? Later on, the Pharisees said this, Search and you will see that no prophet is to arise from Galilee. So Isaiah is giving hope to the people. Like he didn't tell them it would be 700 years. But hope, there is hope in the darkness. In their devastated land, the light of the Messiah will shine. And then there's that verse that we know. No, well, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who have lived in a land of deep, deep darkness, on them light has shined. Isaiah is saying there is hope. There is hope in God. I'll tell you what the Messiah shall do. He shall come and he shall bring with him great joy. Those of you who lived in contempt and, contempt and darkness will one day experience joy again. And that joy will be like the joy of the harvest time when all the crops are brought in and you've seen this, this is what we, we, we've been able to produce. Echoes of Psalm 126 verse 5, the Lord has done great things for us and we rejoiced. The experience of joy of being warriors, victorious in battle and then dividing up the plunder. Psalm 119, I rejoice at your word like one who finds great spoil. And the reason for their joy? The light. The light of God. The yoke which weighs them down presently. The stick that's been put in their neck. The rod shall be removed. And you shall be free of your enemies because... Emmanuel, God with us, has arrived. And then here's our verse. That's all the background, all the context to this verse that we hear so often at Christmas time. For unto us a child is born. His birth will be like every other birth. He will be human. Unto us a son is given. That speaks of his deity. A son will be given to us. This unique gift from God. And God has determined that when the government, of, of his shoulder, uh, government shall be placed upon his shoulders, he shall rule with all authority. And then the son is given four names, each revealing his divine origin, and each name with two parts. He shall be called Wonderful Counselor. In fact, it's better to say he shall be called a wonder of a counsellor. His counselling shall be wonderful. He is mighty God. He has all strength and he is God. This child, this baby soon to be born, never used of a human, mighty God. His name shall be everlasting father. The son to be born is the originator, the father of all eternity. And in him you will discover eternal life. And he is the prince of peace. Only that name of all the four names is also ascribed to a person. Could be the prince of a king who brings peace to the land. But when Isaiah mentions peace, he only mentions it in the context of the peace that God brings. 
Shalom. Shalom. The sovereign ruler of this messianic kingdom is the Messiah himself. When the government of his kingdom is placed on his shoulders, there is eternal peace. He will establish and uphold his kingdom and the nature of his kingdom shall be justice and righteousness and his kingdom will last forever. We know this to be Jesus, don't we? Our Lord, who is the light of the world and who calls you and me with Christ living in us to be the light of the world. In Philippians, Paul tells us that we live in a land of crooks and perverts. But he says, you're not to be like that. You're to shine like the stars of the universe in contrast to the world in which you live. But not only in contrast, influencing as well. That's your life. A life of light, of contrast and influence. And then I read this this past week, and it was both encouraging and challenging to me also. Words from Spurgeon. And Spurgeon, talking about our light, the light of Christ living in us, says this. He says, light is to shine as a mean of guidance, warning, and encouragement. I hope this challenged you as they, as they did me. He says this, Spurgeon writes, he said, a Christian should, should so shine in their life that a person could not live with them a week without knowing the gospel. Their conversation should be such that all who are about them should clearly perceive whose they are and whom they serve and should see the image of Jesus reflected in their daily actions. He goes on, he says, lights are intended for guidance. We are to point sinners to the saviour and the weary to a divine resting place. For some read their Bibles and they fail to understand it, so we should be like Philip ready to instruct the inquirer in the meaning of God's word, the way of salvation and the life of godliness. That's guidance. He says, lights are also used for warning. On our rocks and shoals, a lighthouse is sure to be erected. Christians know that there are many false lights shown everywhere in the world and therefore the right light is needed. And then he said the third aspect of lights is that they have a cheering influence, and so have Christians. A Christian ought to be a comforter, with kind words on their lips, sympathy in their heart. They should carry sunshine wherever they go, and diffuse happiness around them. Wow, encouraging and challenging. With Christ in you, you are the light of the world. Let's pray. Father, I'm absolutely convinced that you bring people across our paths who are currently living in darkness. And that darkness is enveloping their lives, Lord, so deep. The only, the only thing that will rescue them and save them is the light of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray, I do pray, Lord, that in these coming weeks, Lord, we might be conscious that you are alive in us, that you, we might let your light shine in and through our lives. That if anybody comes to live with us for just one week and they do not know you, that they will know the gospel, that we shall diffuse happiness and joy because the joy of the Lord is our strength. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
we respond to what God has been saying to us this morning. We're going to sing King of Kings. And just notice the first two lines say this. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running. There was mercy in your eyes. Let's stand together and sing King of Kings. without murmuring and arguing so that you may be blameless and innocent. Children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation in which you shine like stars in the world. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen.